Welcome to the NCDWI Guy podcast, where defenders of the Constitution assemble to prepare for courtroom battle, and firm owners gather to develop marketing strategies that will revolutionize the practice of criminal defense. Here's your host, the NCDWI Guy, Jake Minnick. Hello, fellow freedom fighters, and welcome to episode 98 of the NC DWI Guy podcast. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. And that, my fellow freedom fighters, is The Man in the Arena by Theodore Roosevelt. One of my favorite poems. That uh, poem really sums up, to me, the heart of a DWI trial lawyer. That is what we are going to be talking about today. We are continuing our DWI Master Series, which we began on episode 90. And over the last couple of weeks, we have reflected on what are some of the qualities, character traits, things that we should be concentrating on to become DWI masters. Back in episode 96, we talked about education, student mindset, becoming a student of DWI law. Last episode, episode 97, we talked about the importance of marketing in becoming a DWI master. Today, we talk about taking cases to trial. That's how you become a DWI master. This is one of those extremely important characteristics of a great trial lawyer, of a great DWI lawyer, is taking cases to trial repeatedly trying and airing. And that sentiment in Theodore Roosevelt's poem of it is the person that is trying and failing and airing, but giving it a go that should be held up. That's the person to emulate. I once heard a lawyer uh, at, at a Georgia CLE that I attended many years back say that you're not a real DWI trial lawyer until you've lost 10 in a row. That's when you know you're a good uh, or a real, as he said, DWI trial lawyer. And the point of that mindset is not that you want to lose cases or that we don't like winning. It's that you're going to take tough cases to trial. That's when you know you're a a real DWI trial lawyer is you're going to take the tough cases to trial, the cases that are difficult to win. DWI cases are hard for the defense to win. That's not true in every case, but the vast majority of DWI cases, the deck is stacked against us. And yet we get to stand up for the Constitution we get to stand up and fight for our client. This is a quote by Thomas Jefferson that puts in perspective the importance of what we do as criminal defense lawyers. 
I consider trial by jury as the only anchor ever yet imagined by man by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution. I'm going to read that one more time and let it sink in because it's extremely important. I consider trial by jury as the only anchor ever yet imagined by man by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution. We are the freedom fighters. We really are the defenders of the constitution. When somebody comes into our office that is charged with a DWI, there may be a factual defense in terms of it was medication. They weren't actually impaired, but if they have broken the law, if they have uh, met each and every uh, element of the offense of violating 20-138.1 by driving a vehicle on a public street or highway while impaired, that's not the end of the analysis. Because despite a statutory violation that creates a traffic crime, just because somebody violates a traffic crime does not give government actors, police officers, the ability to violate the constitution or to themselves violate a statutory provision. There are certain requirements that must be met under the constitution. And as a criminal defense lawyer, as a DWI lawyer, we are blessed with the ability to go to bat every day, to wake up every day, ready to protect and defend the constitution. As we swore in our oath of office that we would do, we get to go to bat for the constitution. And it is a privilege and an honor to be able to do that. And it's exciting to be able to do that. So don't ever forget how important our job is. It is fundamentally important. Criminal defense lawyer Clarence Darrow once said, the only real lawyers are trial lawyers and trial lawyers try cases to juries. The only real lawyers are trial lawyers and trial lawyers try cases to juries. Reading that quote puts a smile on my face. I can't help it. That, that, that's the, the ultimate sentiment of what it means to be a DWI master. When you completely bought into that and you are of the mindset that, yes, I am ready to be in, standing in front of a jury arguing like mad for my client, that's when you met this definition of being a real lawyer. In North Carolina, we have the bifurcated district and superior court set up for misdemeanor cases. So in the context of DWI, you get a bite at the apple in district court in trial, and then you get the right to appeal up to superior court. Exercise that right. Exercise that right to a jury trial for your client. Find the issues that you can present to a jury. Do not let the word guilty from a district court judge end a case that deserves to be appealed. Don't do it. This is how we become DWI masters. DWI masters explore every angle of a case. They fight every angle of the case. If you want to become a DWI master, you got to fight to the bitter end, fight through the appeal process, fight like mad in front of a jury, and you're going to love every second of it. You're going to love every second of it. But it really is this mindset of, I want to take cases to trial that separates lawyers that are good at DWI, lawyers that handle DWI cases from the master's of driving while impaired. Because when you take cases to trial repeatedly, when you get after it in the courtroom, 
you get that practice in that allows you to explore issues that you would not otherwise get to explore. You get to explore these issues. It's so important to be able to explore these issues through practicing and taking tough cases to trial. Bruce Lee once said, practice makes perfect. After a long time of practicing, our work will become natural, skillful, swift, and steady. Practicing makes you a dangerous lawyer. Dangerous lawyer. When you practice, it shows. When you take cases to trial, it shows. Everybody in the courtroom can tell that you have done it, that you have been there before. You can fake it till you make it to some extent, but everybody knows the lawyers in the courtroom that have taken cases repeatedly to trial, that have argued issues during a motion, that try the case to verdict in district court, that appeal and try it to verdict in superior court when there's a good enough legal issue that appeal it to the court of appeals fight them, fight them when they deserve to be fought. And if you do it enough, practice enough by taking these cases repeatedly to trial, as Bruce Lee says, it becomes natural. It becomes habitual, becomes second nature. You will become skillful, as he says, swift. You'll know where you can go in and attack the state's case just like that. Just like that and steady, right? No panic. Constantly in control of the courtroom, constantly in control of where the case is headed. So how do we get good at this? How do we practice? We take cases to trial. And if you want to try a case the right way, then you better prepare like mad for that case. You better prepare like mad for that trial. Litigate every issue. Go after every issue. Don't get strong-armed into some plea if it's not going to hurt you to take it to trial. I think we all too often, and this conversation that we have within the office many times, and I felt this way before in the past, is what if I don't have a great issue to take to trial? Should I take that case in front of a judge and try the case? If your client wants a trial, first of all, they have a right to take the case to trial. But I think much of the time we sit there analyzing in our own heads, should I try to convince my client to enter a guilty plea because there's just nothing here and I don't want to waste the judge's time. I don't want to look silly in front of the judge. I don't want to look like I don't have an issue to argue. And there is some legitimacy to that. If you truly don't have an issue, then that may not be the right route to go. It may be best to really tell your client very candidly and openly, there is nothing here for us to attack. If we take the case to trial, we're going to lose. Maybe there's negative consequences to that, or maybe it's just we're wasting the judge's time and that could cause some sort of minor uh, reflection in terms of the sentence imposed or the consequences that you're going to face. But if there's an issue to be fought, don't feel bad about taking that issue to trial if it's just got a slim chance of winning. If you've got a PC that doesn't look great, but your client doesn't have anything to lose, they want to take it to trial, use it as an opportunity to grow in your practice to put your skills into practice, to put the education that we talked about in episode 96 into practice. Fight these things. Take them to trial. Make them work for it. It is crazy to me how many times I have thought about a case, not expected a good outcome from my client, And then we're successful in emotion or we're successful with the verdict return from a judge or from a jury. I had a case about two years back. This this is one of those that I'll I'll never forget. 
Um, I had a client that was stopped uh, uh, for speeding. The officer had actually kind of lost track of my client. He was uh, going ahead of her on a four lane highway. She kind of loses sight of him at one point, finds him uh, again, uh, or finds the vehicle she thinks she had seen earlier in a neighborhood. She had never gotten a tag. Um, you know, was really never able to identify the driver. In fact, thought that the driver of the original car was the opposite sex of my client. There was a whole bunch of different issues in terms of identifying the vehicle that she ultimately stopped. So we fought this thing in uh, court on the stop. I think we also fought it on PC, but the stop was the real issue. So we fought this thing the judge found that there was reasonable suspicion to stop, that there was probable cause to arrest. The case got continued for a couple of months. Can't remember why after that pretrial motion, we came back for trial. And I told my client, I had multiple conversations with my client that the game is over. You blew at the jail. Uh, you know, there, there's nothing here that we can, we can fight. There's no way to fight the admissibility of the breath test. The judges decided against us on these issues. I don't see any way that we can win. And I repeatedly hammer this to my client. I did. There's just nothing here to attack. There's nothing for me to argue at this point. The argument has already been had on these pretrial motions and my client didn't listen to me. And sometimes that makes me angry because uh, you're sitting there offering what you think is great advice to your client, but he didn't listen to me. He's like, look, if this isn't going to really make much of a difference one way or the other, let's just take the trial and see what happens. And I thought to myself, okay, we'll give it a whirl. That's what he wants to do. I've told him I don't have anything else to argue. We'll let the state present what it's got left to present. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll ask questions on cross-examination. So we go through the trial and the judge sits up there and is thinking about the case and thinking about the basis for the stop and ultimately finds my client not guilty of driving while impaired. And I'll tell you, I've never been more floored by a not guilty verdict. I really felt like we should have won on reasonable suspicion. So I don't, I don't feel like it was the wrong ultimate result in terms of the case being dismissed, but I was not expecting that not guilty verdict. And there are many times when we feel like we're not going to win on PC, we're not going to win on this issue. And because of the ability to hear from other attorneys at my firm, how often something that they think is just not going to work in the courtroom ends up in a dismissal or a not guilty or something goes wildly awry. The officer doesn't show up. One of the necessary witnesses isn't there. You never know what is going to happen on a trial until you take the case to trial. And you might have a really good feeling about it. You might have a really good insight into this is a great case to take to trial or it's not. But until you actually put it in front of the judge and make somebody else make a decision about the case, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Don't be afraid to try bad cases. Don't do it to the detriment of your client. Don't hurt your client by taking cases to trial without considering the consequences of that but also don't be afraid to try cases that don't seem to be great cases to take to trial. That client dragged me kicking and screaming into trial and good for him for doing that because he got a not guilty because he stood firm on that side of things. Good for him. Practice. Will Smith once said, no matter how talented you are, your talent will fail you if you are not skilled. Skill is achieved through practice. Work hard and dedicate yourself to being better every single day. It makes sense. Everything that we hear from athletes, from actors, from professionals about how they got to where they are, it's always hard work. It's always dedication. It's always practice. We cannot become a DWI master if we're not repeatedly working at our craft, not just studying, which is so vitally important, but actually doing it, actually taking cases to trial. 
It's amazing to win the tough cases. That's the ones that you will remember are the ones where you thought that your client's back was going to be up against the wall and you argue those cases to a successful outcome. Louis Armstrong in the same vein of practice once said, if I don't practice for a day, I know it. If I don't practice for two days, the critics know it. And if I don't practice for three days, the public knows it. And if you don't practice for four days and for five days, a lot of times you just don't come back to practicing. A lot of times you just quit. We need more lawyers trying cases. Every lawyer in every jurisdiction that handles criminal defense work should have regular trials. If you're regularly practicing in district court, there's got to be some case coming across your desk that is worthy of trial. We need lawyers trying more cases. We need that to hold the state accountable. It is our bargaining chip when it comes to DWI practice. Plea or trial. 90% of the time, that's the options. Plea or trial. You can plead to it or I can go in front of a judge and get the judge to convict your client. Okay, let's do it that route because that's the only bargaining chip that we have to play sometimes. And the more we try the difficult cases, I'm telling you right now, the more we try the difficult cases, the more willing the state is going to be to dismiss the cases that should be dismissed. In jurisdictions where defense attorneys are regularly taking DWI cases to trial, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the state is way more likely to get rid of crappy DWI charges because they're not going to have time for it. If everybody's pleading guilty, you're going to see 0.06 cases getting tried by the state. If everybody is pleading guilty, you're going to see bad PC cases uh, getting tried. You just, just put it in front of the judge. It's when we push these things to trial as a group that we can have that kind of impact for the state to have to really think about which cases it wants to push. It's a collective effort. It is not an individual effort to make that change. And so if you're trying to be one of the DWI masters that's at the front end of this push and inspiring other people in your particular jurisdiction to push cases to trial, show that it's okay to take bad cases to trial. Show that it's okay to take low probability cases to trial. Get in there, argue the case law, argue in front of the judge, make the state work for it. Show that to the other members of the defense bar. One thing that we have to do in order to try more cases is eliminate barriers to trial. Got to eliminate any barriers to trial. One of the ways to do this practical point here is to be ready for trial early. One of the barriers of trial is that it can take three, four, six, eight court dates at least in Buncombe County, to take a case to trial. So I don't know what this looks like across the state. Some, some uh, counties are more stingy on continuances for both sides than uh, the place that I pr primarily practice of, of Buncombe, but every place is different, but it may take multiple, multiple court dates to get to trial. So one barrier of entry is you've got a limited amount of time. If you're driving to a remote county, it's easier to do a trial in two court dates than it is to do it in six. So if you're going to take a case to trial, be ready to go early. Get yourself prepared from the get-go. Because you will get worn down by the state. The state knows that time is on its side for the most part. Your, your client's going to get tired of coming back and forth to court. 
it is a barrier to trial for cases to get continued and for the time game to get played. Don't let your fees be a barrier of entry to trial. Get discovery. Get discovery on cases. You have to have the discovery in order to effectively defend a DWI case. Get that discovery. Get it as early as you possibly can. And bounce your case off of another attorney in your jurisdiction. We always are thinking through cases on our own. Maybe the case is, is better than we're painting it in our head or worse than we're painting it in our head, but bounce that case off of somebody else. You'd be surprised how many times if you get another attorney to look at a DWIR, discuss a case with you, you might have a whole new angle of attack that opens up that you can present in the courtroom. Take advantage of the current DWI masters that are in your jurisdiction because they're everywhere. We got a ton of great trial lawyers in our state, a ton of great DWI trial lawyers in the state of North Carolina. Go tap into that resource. They're ready to help you. They want you to win. I'm telling you right now, it, nothing makes me happier than seeing my colleagues successfully try DWI cases. Doesn't matter if it's my client or not. I am, I am definitely biased when it comes to cheering in the courtroom. I am pulling for the defense. I'm a cheerleader. I will, I will help. If you're sitting in the courtroom and I'm, I'm near you, I will be happy to offer any input. Mid-trial, whenever. I'm pulling for you. And so are most of our colleagues across the state. They're pulling for it. They're pulling for you. Take these things to trial. They're ready for you. My last quote of the day, this is in regard to practice, comes from none other than Allen Iverson. And this quote that I found made me laugh. So I'm just going to share it. It's a, great, it's a great quote, but it just made me laugh. I got I to gotta bring this out. I don't know how many people in the audience can remember Allen Iverson talking about practice, Right. His, his whole monologue of, we're not even talking about the game, talking about practice, man, and kind of dissing practice to some extent, kind of devaluing practice. So when I saw this quote, it made me think maybe Alan was just having a bad day the day that he gave that monologue that he became famous for, where it seemed like he wasn't putting in the work ethic. You know that guy was practicing more than anybody else on his team. He's one of the best players in the NBA. You know he was putting in the time. You know he was putting in the energy and the effort. That guy was a workhorse. So that was probably not the best representation. But I found this quote from Allen Iverson. When you are not practicing, someone else is getting better. I think that's his real mindset when it comes to practicing. If you want to be a DWI master, you got to keep working at it. I can't remember who's, who said this. So I, I, I lied. There's one, one more quote, but that maybe Vince Lombardi, I'm not sure. But uh, this same idea, somewhere someone is training while I am not. And when we meet, he will win. One great advantage that the state has on DWI cases is they get to practice. They're trying cases every day. They're trying cases all the time. As a prosecutor, you get to try a ton of cases that you don't get to prepare for them very, very much. So that's an advantage to the defense is that we get to prepare for our cases. But advantage to the state is practice. So the only way to keep up with them is to take cases to trial and get practice yourself. The state has to try a lot of bad cases. They're used to it. They're used to trying bad cases, cases where the outcome may be kind of somewhat known ahead of time, but they still have to take those cases to trial. They still have to work for it and they get that practice in. We need to do the same thing.
we need to go after cases so that we can get the practice in on, on our end. Don't be afraid to take difficult cases to trial because it is in doing that that you become a DWI master. Be the man in the arena. Be the woman in the arena. Don't sit on the sideline. Look forward to speaking with you next time. If you found the information in this podcast to be valuable, I simply ask that you pay it forward and share this podcast with another member of the legal community. Also, if you would leave us a rating or a review on whatever platform you are listening on, I would greatly appreciate it.